First of all, welcome, and thank you for coming out to this evening's event. My name is Adam Jones, and I am one of the 28 volunteer directors of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast. The MIT Enterprise Forum is a nonprofit, volunteer-driven organization with a mission to promote and support entrepreneurship. The Central Coast chapter of the MIT Enterprise Forum has been in existence for 26 years, and we are one of the 27 worldwide chapters. As you can see, we're going to be filming tonight's event. This is the 14th time we filmed the program, and tonight's event will be available for broadcast on cable channel 21 in the coming months. If you'd like to get a listing of the times it's going to be shown, you can go to sbchannels.tv. I would like to take a minute to thank all of our sponsors. They make it possible for us to put on these meetings, and we really appreciate their support. Our premier sponsors are Stradling Yaka, Carlson & Ralph, Attorneys at Law, Radius Commercial Real Estate and Investments, Bank of the West, Express Employment Professionals, CIO Solutions, Riviera Insurance Services, Nassif Hicks Harrison Company, Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, Pacific Coast Business Times, and Vices LLC. Our supporting sponsors are DuPont Displays, Mission Ventures, Newshawk, Alma Rosa Winery, and EVC, the Economic Vitality Corporation. I would also like to acknowledge and thank Guy Smith for all his work putting on tonight's program. He's really the one who drove everything and organized tonight's event, so we really appreciate what he did for us. He's also a member of the board of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast, and he is the special assistant to the president at Antioch University. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Reed Sheard, who's our moderator for this evening's event. Reed currently serves as Vice President for College Advancement and CIO at Westmont College, a position he's held since 2008. Prior to that, he served as Vice President and CIO at Spring Arbor University in Michigan, where he was instrumental in developing their online program in education. Reed is also a member of the MIT, board member of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast, and in his past, he's worked at Apple, Consonus, and Informix Software. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Reed. We have a really exciting uh, program for tonight in talking about online learning. Uh, it's a lot of opinions about online learning, uh, some in favor of it strongly, some uh, not favoring it strongly, and others in between. One thing as an entrepreneurial gathering that cannot be denied is the explosive growth uh, the dialogue around this particular topic. We've gathered together some wonderful panelists tonight that represent different spectrums as it relates to learning using online tools, and I think we're in for a fascinating conversation. As uh, corporations and educational institutions increasingly embrace uh, technology to deliver education online and learning, uh, there's a lot of good things that have been happening around that. Uh, we're very interested in the fact that experts are predicting by 2018 that more students and more people will be taking uh, courses and seminars via an online format than they will face-to-face. -face. Uh, and that uh, growth, exponential growth, has occurred in the last 15 years. So you can think of a couple hundred years prior to that for face-to-face -face instruction and then 15 years being surpassed. It's very similar to other online services that we're seeing, this exponential growth, certainly learning is, is one of them. As with any good topic, as I've said, there's going to be a lot of opinions on this, and we've, we've got a group of experts here and people here in the room uh, that I think will lead to a very, very good uh, discussion on that. I like categories. They help me kind of remember particular topics or ideas or points that are made. I'd like to give you three categories to kind of hold as you're listening to the various presentations, and I'll talk about the format of the evening. The three categories are when you think of online uh, education or learning, uh, we've got accredited education perhaps on one spectrum where students take a course uh, or even a series of courses for a degree from uh, undergraduate all the way through doctorate in order to, to get a, an accredited degree via an online uh, school somewhere in the United States or the world. On the other side of that spectrum, you would find business learning 
where you've got goals and outcomes, but they're not really to accomplish accredited uh, learning, but they are for perhaps a, a specific objective, a goal, professional development of a staff, those sorts of things. Uh, and that would be represented by the uh, cost savings, things like that would be represented by the business. And I think in the middle of that, you're going to have something that's represented by lynda.com that talks about online learning that is really learning for learning's sake. And these three kind of categories, I encourage you to hold those as you're hearing the different uh, presentations and as the Q&A happens and it will lead to a good discussion. At this point, I'd like to introduce our, our panel. And the way the format will go, each panelist will, will speak uh, for 10 to 15 minutes uh, on their particular area of expertise as it relates to online education or, and learning. And then following that, I've got some questions prepared that we'll work through. And then we'll open it up for Q&A uh, with all of you here uh, to ask questions of the panelists. Because the, this is being televised, uh, we will have two people in the room, uh, Adam and Guy, who will have microphones. So when you get ready to uh, ask your question, raise your hand. One of those two individuals will get to you. That way we can get your audio recorded as part of the question if people are watching this on TV. All right, well, to my left, uh, we have Dr. Britt uh, Andreata, who serves as the chair of the bachelor's degree program at Antioch University here in Santa Barbara. And she oversees all aspects of the undergraduate degree program from admissions to graduation and many, many things that happen in between that. PhD is from the University of Santa Barbara, where she was, had served for over 20 years, and also the author of Navigating the Research University, a Guide to First-Year Students. Uh, to her left is uh, Alan Moses. Alan's uh, engaged in a very interesting topic I think you'll enjoy uh, at UC Santa Barbara in the College of Letters and Sciences uh, called Collaborate. And I won't say too much about that because I want him to be able to share that. Uh, Alan and I have met and talked about that. And I think it's really, in the UC system, it's a, it's a fascinating and very important uh, experiment and learning uh, objective that they've got going there. Uh, Linda uh, Weinman is uh, the co-founder of lynda.com, and uh, Linda wrote the very first book designing on web design uh, for designing web graphics in 1995 and really got her career started as a writer. And um, Linda's story is equally fascinating as, uh, as an author and interested in helping people learn uh, how lynda.com happened. And driven, and this is for all of us that have enjoyed good education, it often is a result of a good instructor. Uh, and almost always the result of a good instructor and passion around material and content. And, and when that comes together in the right way, it's, it's quite special. And I think you, you'll enjoy hearing uh, Linda's story uh, on that. Uh, Harry Starn, uh, who is an executive faculty member at uh, Cal Lutheran University in the MBA program in financial planning, and teaches both face-to-face -face and online, and uh, has students that actually do both, and students that only do online, and can talk about this, uh, instead of a dichotomy between face-to-face -face and online, how perhaps the two environments can, can work together. Uh, Harry also just was recently awarded the Bronze Award in Excellence for Distance Learning by the United States Distance Learning Association. I think you'll find his comments uh, very interesting, a lot of passion and expertise behind delivering accredited online learning. And then lastly, uh, Bob Lee, who's the Product Marketing Manager for Learning Solutions at Citrix Online and is responsible for a product go to training, which is a cloud-based service uh, delivering uh, corporate training uh, to uh, individuals and, and corporations around the country. So with that, uh, we'll have, as I said, comments from, from each panelist for 10 to 15 minutes, and then a series of questions, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Um, well, I'm Britt Andreata. Nice to meet all of you. It's nice to see such a, such a great turnout this evening. I thought um, I would best just represent my own journey. I've been an educator for more than 20 years and a big fa fan and, and deliverer of face-to-face -face education. And then I had to go online. 
and um, did so reluctantly and became a huge fan. So I wanted to talk about my educator, my journey as an educator, because I think that's where this transition really lives, is how do we get educators to be able to deliver their education in a, in a format that they may not be comfortable with or may not be familiar with. So a little about my background. I have an MA in communication where I studied mass media and then my PhD is in education where I studied college student success. I've taught for over 20 years in higher education, mainly at UC Santa Barbara where I taught in several different departments. Um, and then I taught at Pacifica Graduate Institute where I taught completely online and now I'm at Antioch University where we use different delivery models. The courses I teach are always interactive and very personal, things like social justice issues, um, all kinds of kind of intensely personal or controversial topics. And that was for me the biggest challenge is, is how do I take something like that and do it in an online environment? And as I mentioned, I, I was very attached to face-to-face, -face, but I'm now really a, a big fan of hybrid and online models. So through my observations of teaching online, I kind of came up with some key points. Anonymity creates an intimacy in the online classroom that does not exist in face-to-face, -face, in my experience. People will say things to a screen and a keyboard <laughs> that they wouldn't necessarily say to a live person next to them. So I have noticed that the, the depth of the conversation can really be um, much richer in an online environment than in a face-to-face -face environment. Flexibility creates performance. People can do the work when they're ready to. So if they're night owls, they can do their work at 2 o'clock in the morning. If they're early birds, they can do it at 6 a.m. If their kid has a cold, they can wait till that's done and jump online and do their work. So I have found that that really works. Um, I also think that people with disabilities of various types can do well in an online environment because they can choose to process the information over and over again or fiddle with the format that they, they have it so that they can process it in a way that works for them. And then how many of you know about Myers-Briggs personality types? Show of hands. So one of the scales is the EI scale, the extroversion and the introversion scale, which is a measure of how you, how you get energy, but largely also how you process information. E's are the people who are outgoing, we love to hang out with people, we get energy from people, but we're also the people who process our thinking out loud. You hear the E's in a face-to-face -face classroom. You don't hear the I's in a face-to-face -face classroom. And those of us who have taught know we'll get papers from students who never say a peep in our class, but they have the richest dialogue going on in their assignments. Well, what I love about online is the I's come forward. And they only sit down at the keyboard when they're ready to say something, but because you're ha you know, everyone's doing that, all of a sudden their voice is in the room. It's part of the dialogue that the students are having. And I, frankly, that's one of my favorite parts of teaching online. Community creates commitment. Students of various ages, I've taught everyone from traditional 18 to you know, 65 plus, um, they have some commitment to the instructor. But if they care about their peers, they have more commitment to their peers. And what I have found about an online like, dialogue that you might be having is that if I was to post a discussion item, some students would comment on it and maybe for the suck up factor, right? But when a student posts something, all the other students feel really committed to validate that person or respond to that person. So I've seen students do 10 times the amount of work online that they would have done in face-to-face -face because they care about their peers in a way that is really um, demonstrative online. <coughs> Technology creates cutting edge. By the time a textbook gets published, the, the research in that textbook is five years old because it first comes through the journal system and then it gets put into a textbook and just the way publishing works. Well, the great thing about being online is you can change your readings the instant something comes out in a scholarly journal. You can update to the latest link. Right now in one of my classrooms, we're talking about the coming out process and um, the social justice issues around homosexuality. Well, every, sadly, right now, there's a lot in the news around these teens committing suicide, and each time a new story comes up, I'm able to bring it into the classroom dialogue. So it allows you to really keep your content very fresh. Interactivity creates acceleration. When you teach traditionally, oftentimes how you gauge students' work is to give them an assignment and you get all those papers or re journals or whatever it is and you grade them and you see individually students getting or not getting the concepts. When that learning happens in a community online, the minute a few of them get it, the rest of them get it. 
they share in that knowledge. And so now as an instructor, I can add a new discussion question or a new teaching point. And you know, you gauge the instruction as it's going along over the week. Where are they? And then you launch the thing in that takes it to the next level and the next level and the next level. And so you actually can accelerate the deepening of the learning process by watching that kind of interaction. And for some students, just enough rope to hang themselves with. <laughs> So the reality of online learning is also that st students who are not very good at structuring their time and managing themselves in terms of due dates or getting their work done without having an instructor face-to-face -face reminding them can get themselves in trouble. But I find that's really a small minority and, and is far less, what's the word? The risk of that is less in comparison to the riches that come from this other model. Some things that you think about when teaching online is certainly learning, learning management software. There's a lots of different models out there. I've taught in at least five different versions, WebCT, Desire to Learn, Sakai, Moodle. Um, they all kind of have similar tools, but they look a little different. Are you going to be hybrid or distance? Hybrid has some face-to-face -face component. Distance is completely online, even if people are literally a mile away from you. But certainly, um, you can, uh, when I taught at Pacifica, we had students in our online classroom in Mexico, Switzerland, Japan, the United States, different time zone. Time zone issues means you've got to think about synchronous or asynchronous. If they're all on the West Coast, you can go synchronous and have people log on at the same time to do some things together, maybe even use something like Adobe Connect to have a face-to-face -face meeting online. You can actually see 10 different screens at the same time. Um, or asynchronous, time zone doesn't matter. Uh, ratio of text and image, you're going to use a little bit of both, but do you videotape yourself giving a lecture and they watch a video, or do you type out your lecture pieces and they read those? You know, do you use um, readings, links, all kinds of things? Closed or open community, you know, I'm at a university where we're doing this credited education. So right now, our courses are open to people who are paying to earn those credits to build their degree. But there's a lot of initiatives out there that are open, open to anyone, free. Credit or no credit. The, the phrase that you hear over and over in this business is when you teach online, you become the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage because it's less about lecturing at people and downloading information as it is about generating a co-learning process that you monitor and accelerate as needed. Um, and there's lots more decisions that I don't know about that my panelists are probably more um, experienced with than I. Now, talking in my role as chair, I oversee everything from admissions, curriculum, development, graduation requirements, faculty training, supervision, resource management, both fiscal and facility. And delivery models is tied to every one of those. What kind of program do students expect? People want more flexibility now. Certainly that can help you um, with resource management. If you have a class that's happening in their pajamas <laughs> off campus, you don't have a class space that's being taken up at that same moment. So you can maximize your space. And it costs more to get a class up online initially, but over time there's a big savings. So there's fiscal savings ultimately. A little bit about Antioch, just for those of you who don't know, we're a degree completion program. Students come in with a minimum of 30 units and a max of 120. We have several major concentrations, applied psychology, business management, entrepreneurship, child, family, and society, with new ones coming soon, communication and media, and global studies and conflict resolution. We have an early decider program where students can overlap their BA with their teaching credential. And our graduates get admitted to all kinds of graduate programs and professional opportunities, including med school, law school, MBA programs, et cetera. Who our students are are working adults looking for flexible options. That's the majority of our students. Career movers, individuals in transition, students transferring directly from two-year institutions. But I have to say that we're getting a lot of transfers from four-year schools, students who want a smaller experience. Um, aspiring professionals preparing for graduate study, first generation college students, and we get a lot of returning students, people who started their college degree long ago and never finished it and want to come back and pick it up and, and finish it. So we have a lot of midlife learners. Currently, we offer these courses in a hybrid model, which means of the 30 contact hours they need for three units, and the 30 contact hours is then 
also has an additional 70 hours of academic work outside of the contact hours. Um, hybrid courses have some of that 30 contact hours face to face. And it could be three three hour sessions or two Saturdays. It can look a lot of different ways. So these are the classes that right now we're offering in a hybrid format. And then we have several distance courses, which all contact occurs in the online environment. And you really have to look at what does it mean by contact. The faculty needs to be actively engaged with the student learning process, um, not just logging in and checking the, the stats. You know, are they talking to each other? But you're actually engaging with them in some way. And then just finally, there's a lot of initiatives happening. Um, in online education right now, and the Chronicle of Higher Ed recently did an article on this, but MIT has an open course where it's a, a whole range of really amazing courses that are online um, and for free. So you can just log in and take some really amazing courses. Carnegie Mel Mellon has a self-guided materials where it's really that learning for learning sake materials that are made available. Virginia Tech has a learning lab math emporium where they're really using online education specifically around math learning. Purdue University is using the Signals Project, which is really a student performance tracking system. There's a software package that lines up with the learning management software, and staff and faculty give students a green, yellow, or red light, depending on how their performance is going, so that an academic advisor, a faculty member, a counselor at the mental health services can all kind of log in and see if this student is in crisis, either academically or personally, and, and keep track of them. iTunes U is, is now bringing on a whole catalog of learning materials, again, for learning for learning's sake. And Academic Earth, same thing. They're kind of a consortium of um, a place you can look for online courses and degrees, and many of those are for credit, but many are not. So that's kind of my introduction. I'm now going to pass it to Alan. Well, hi, I'm Alan Moses. I'm here from UC Santa Barbara. I'm the uh, coordinator of technology for the College of Letters and Sciences. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my perspective on these things. Um, as a technologist, a lot of my role uh, over the course of my career has been involved in supporting faculty. And a lot of them are very passionate about instruction. And so that has been one of the major drivers in the sorts of things I've done over the course of my career. Uh, the other big influence in my interest in these areas is I'm the parent of two very self-directed and independent learners who have gone through their uh, elementary, secondary, and completed liberal arts education, very self-driven and very adept at using various technologies, whatever technologies were made available to them or they invented on their own as they saw fit. Uh, and so my interests in educational technologies are both learner-led and also instructor-driven. And I think these two perspectives are, are both very important components of what these technologies can bring. Um, what I want to do in, in, in this next couple minutes is give you a sense of a couple of the things that are going on at UCSB uh, right now, in particular in the College of Letters and Science. Um, as Reed mentioned, uh, we are coming up on one year into a, a very exciting new initiative uh, named Collaborate. Uh, this has um, gone from, uh, over the years, UCSB has a, had a lot of very interesting individual efforts, uh, individual faculty supported by a variety of, uh, of service organizations. Um, but what we initiated about a year ago was a comprehensive approach providing a set of baseline technologies aimed primarily at uh, online tools and materials, uh, technology in classrooms for presentation and interaction, uh, instructional uh, computer-based uh, laboratories, and uh, more tools to support uh, the student advising processes and, and the other student support uh, things that go on at the university. Um, the technologies involved in this uh, are not cutting edge. Uh, quite the opposite, we aimed at providing a baseline of common tools that would be available across the curriculum uh, to all of the faculty. Uh, what we did focus on in this initiative is on support for faculty, uh, that the early adopters have never been a problem. Uh, as a technologist, they've always been uh, uh, the goads to getting us to do good things. 
but for wide adoption to impact uh, the large number of students. Um, there are a lot of faculty who don't need a second career as a technologist, and it's not just not a driver for them. And so a big part of this initiative was providing a structure that would allow faculty to be supported to use these tools in an effective manner. Um, the interest that you, in the College of Letters and Science, uh, there's almost no interest in distance ed. The interest is primarily in uh, hybrid uh, courses, using these tools as a component of what's going on in the classroom. Um, the, uh, the, there is a lot of student access uh, aim uh, as uh, these tools can bring, you know, certainly students being able to access materials you know, from any time uh, and any place. Uh, but most of the interest is in the effects of that access rather than in, the ac in accommodating students per se. So for example, there's a lot of students interested in having um, lecture capture available online. Uh, some of that motivation is for review purpose and others are, well, I guess maybe I don't need to go to class because I can pick that up later. In each individual class, it's still driven by the faculty to determine whether that is a tool that's appropriate to what they want to accomplish. And it's very interesting to watch faculty try to hit the balance point between providing materials uh, and providing opportunities to learn, and at the same time, hitting their comfort level for making sure that students are taking advantage of the things that the classroom uh, interaction allows as well. Um, and that there are technologies that, uh, that are available for all sides of that equation. And it's very much, in our experience, it's been a very individual process for each faculty member to determine what is going to work in their situation. Um, the sorts of trends that I've been seeing uh, over the course of this year um, have been interesting. Uh, certainly, as this was proposed and a lot of the discussion before, uh, especially the online component was available, there was a lot of discussion about getting materials online. And certainly there are tremendous uh, advantages of having uh, the materials available for review. But the shift uh, has been very quickly away from materials per se and more towards activities. That is, not simply having materials available, but what are students going to do with those materials? Is there an online component of the interaction with those materials? Are there tools for annotation? Are there discussions going on in forums around the material that is available online? And that shift was a very uh, quick one, based primarily on faculty interest in, in having something that they can have a sense of what are, what are the outcomes of having these materials available. Um, it's been uh, very interesting to see how different, how a single tool can be used in different ways in different settings. Um, certainly one of the things that's available online that generated a lot of uh, interest uh, early on uh, were online quizzes um, and the sorts of things that can be done with that. Once this tool was available, there are a couple different directions that different uh, departments and instructors went. Uh, one of the areas in the face of uh, uh, budget cuts uh, in a lot of the math courses, uh, certainly giving homework assignments uh, didn't abate at all, but having readers available to actually evaluate the student's work and give them feedback on it, you know, that was one of the areas that was, uh, was uh, under a lot of pressure. And so the uh, math department actually, before the Collaborate initiative, uh, found a tool that allowed online quizzing to give that immediate feedback to students on the homework assignments. And that certainly, uh, being able to use those sorts of tools come up in a lot of different disciplines. But the other sorts of uses of those tools have been equally interesting to me and I think point to a lot of directions that uh, faculty, as they talk amongst themselves, are starting to uh, be interested in exploring. Uh, we have one instructor who uh, started requiring a, uh, a very low stakes quiz before each lecture on the assigned reading materials. So a half a point towards a you know, 100 point um, you know, grade curve for the quarter. Uh, and the half a point was enough to motivate students to take it. His intent was not to grade students on whether they did the material or not, but to 
to mold his lecture to the areas where students were having the most problems. And so it was a quiz not as an evaluation tool, but as a teaching tool uh, for himself. And so those sorts of uses of tools, I think uh, that's been a hallmark of what we've been trying to do. We're putting tools out there and making them available to faculty with the assumption that they're going to teach us how they want to use them. Um, another major trend, and this is, uh, I think, something that uh, is a very important one at, at UCSB right now, is that um, as a research institution, um, having access to active research and scholarship is central to the educational philosophy. Um, and so it, the collaborative aspects of research and scholarship have been the areas where a lot of faculty are interested in trying to find online analogs. Uh, so the sorts of things that uh, a lot of faculty are looking at are um, you know, collaborative writing tools, uh, peer review processes, uh, persuasive presentations. Uh, in our instructional laboratories, we actually um, had a specific request to design one of our labs so that there wasn't a computer in front of everyone, uh, to have tables that where students could gather together and have conversations, break apart from those conversations, go to computers, come back uh, to the table, and have those aspects of collaboration and conversation be what was uh, happening in the computer-assisted laboratory. Um, and so I think that uh, as a research institution, there's a lot of focus on bringing research into the classroom. That's always been uh, what, has, what the attempt has been uh, at, uh, at UC. The online capabilities uh, to do that lead to certain tools better than others, and certainly the collaboration tools in particular are an area uh, that there is a lot of interest. Um, I want to briefly mention, uh, besides UCSB and, and Letters and Science uh, in particular, there's also been a, a lot of interest UC system-wide. Um, and in fact, there's just been a call for, uh, uh, a pre-proposal call, uh, letters of intent, uh, for what they're calling an online instruction pilot project. And uh, this got a, a certain amount of press in the Chronicle of Higher Ed and other places as well. Uh, one of the topics that uh, uh, we were uh, prepped on to consider were uh, the business opportunities associated with the migration to online education and training. And I think that is certainly one of the factors on the minds of the administrators at UC system-wide. Um, the real interesting thing uh, and a very rich thing about the UC system is the uh, shared involvement of faculty in decision processes. And this has been a wonderful uh, balancing for the various drivers that could lead people to online education in terms of uh, the resource constraints, you know, classrooms, costs, and, and things along those lines. But at the same time, the focus of this pilot project has been pre pretty clearly directed towards um, finding those ways to have a comparable experience to a UC classroom experience, and that is the very uh, research institution-oriented approach to uh, classroom experience. And so it'll be very interesting to see uh, where this goes. There certainly are uh, tensions involved. Uh, certainly, you know, as I said, there isn't a driver for distance ed coming from faculty right now, uh, at least in my experience uh, in, uh, at UCSB. Uh, but certainly it's an area where UC is very interested. By trying to look at comparable experiences, uh, they're also focusing at the large, uh, usually lower division, sequence courses. And so it becomes a very uh, interesting question to pose because a comparable research institution experience, uh, and a lot of times you're comparing it to 600 students sitting in Campbell Hall which is not really a high bar to hit in terms of classroom experience. And so that, that brings me to, to the last point that uh, I wanted to make, which is, for me, one of the richest aspects of this discussion of thinking about teaching and learning and what technology can bring is that it poses the question of, well, what is effective? And I think that is the key question 
technology assisted or not in terms of learning as we're looking at learning into the future. What are the effective uh, approaches? And how do you measure what is effective? And I think that that focus is certainly a big part of what's going on at UCSB and UC system wide. So thank you. I'll pass it to Linda. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm the co founder of Linda.com, Linda and we're new to the area. We just recently moved our offices from, we started in Ojai, and then we moved to Ventura, and now we're based in Carpinteria. And we have about 160 employees, and what we do is we produce um, education. We have a library that has over 50,000 videos that can be subscribed to, so anybody who becomes a member of our service can access any of these 50,000 videos that we produce. And the videos um, mostly teach technology, computer skills, software, and design. And um, so we would be teaching all of the Adobe, Apple, Microsoft, Autodesk, all kinds of different tools that are available, as well as a lot of the new online applications like um, social networking sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, how to do uh, search engine optimization, and, and a whole um, variety of hundreds of topics. Um, we have about 300 instructors who contribute to lynda.com, and we call them authors. And we call them authors because they create their own materials. They come to us with ideas that we approve. And um, we then produce their content, and we put a lot of polish into how we present their, at their education. So we're all sitting here at a lecture, and um, to go to one of Brian's points, um, this is a synchronous experience. We're all listening to exactly uh, the same lectures and, and panelists. Um, when you're in an asynchronous environment, every one of us could be having a different learning experience. And that's what it's like to come to lynda.com. So one person might be coming to learn Excel and Word, and another person might be coming to learn Photoshop and Final Cut. And um, the difference between a lot of um, what you see on the, on the free sites, like what the different universities are publishing, is that those um, lectures are, are being filmed, much like this is being filmed. So whatever visualization um, is being provided, um, I'm providing none, um, you know, makes the, can make the lecture more or less interesting. But there, there really is not a whole lot of visual excitement about just watching a person speak. And it, so one of the enhancements that we do is we um, team up an instructor with a producer who figures out the very most compelling way to deliver that education. And uh, we memorialize it via uh, videos. And all of the instructors on lynda.com actually make royalties. We're a, we're a paid model. It's very affordable. It uh, starts at $25 a month. And you can just subscribe for one month, so it's less than the cost of most textbooks on a single topic where you'd have access to hundreds of topics at this price on lynda.com. And all of the authors are um, incentivized in that they, however popular their courses are, how many clicks it gets, is how they earn royalties and they earn their income this way. And so we've created kind of what we like to call a win-win ecosystem where um, every author is benefiting from publishing courses on our platform. And they're also promoting lynda.com to other people because it benefits them to have people come to our website. Um, we're more than a website. We also offer everything on mobile, and I think mobile is a huge trend. It's going to surpass personal computing. It already has in terms of numbers of people who have mobile devices. So um, lynda.com has an ability um, over the, in the last couple of years where we've converted our movies into lots of different formats so they can be viewed on um, things like the iPhone, the iPad, um, Android, a lot of the different um, smartphones. And um, so we believe that uh, how we deliver the training is really uh, dictated by how people would want to consume it. And um, one of our goals is to really be as helpful as we possibly can to the hundreds of thousands of members that subscribe to our service. Um, in a down economy, our business has been growing um, very quickly. and. We've experienced incredible 
um, success and growth. We were just honored by the Inc. 5000 as uh, in the top fastest growing. We were the number 12 in education in terms of the fastest growing com com companies in America. Um, so there is a lot of what's really amazing is that people are willing to pay for uh, a nominal, you know, affordable fee for excellent education and that um, I think what it taps into is that people really are motivated to, to teach themselves things and learn things. And we hear from our members every single day about what a valuable service we're providing and how much they're getting out of it and how it's helping them grow their careers and change jobs and do better and do the kinds of things that they want to do. Um, and I think one of the real benefits is that personalization that um, if you, you that through an online facility like what we're offering, everybody can come and learn at their own pace and learn what you're interested in learning in a nonlinear fashion. So that once again, in a synchronous presentation like this, some of you, you know, may be zoning out with, you know, one person talking about something you already know about or you're not interested in this, you are interested in that. And so there's a lot more kind of direct um, control that you have over your learning in an online experience like what we're offering, which is this kind of library approach. Um, I think that uh, there's also so, I, I heard um, uh, Alan talk a little bit about what you can learn by providing an online service and that you can observe the behavior of your learners and what it is that they're going to. And also, if you provide a feedback mechanism, which we do, we um, listen very carefully to what our members say. It can really help you deliver a better education because you're able to so um, instantly get that feedback and then act on it if you're um, if you so choose, which um, which we really pride ourselves on. We're very member focused and always trying to make the very um, best possible education that we can. And that's really our mission is to um, create an, an excellent member experience and, and a learning experience that exceeds the expectations of those who are coming to us. Um, and so. Uh, my personal background is just that I started off teaching computers back in the early days when the only way you could learn them was through incomprehensible manuals, and I just discovered that I could learn them and learn how to do uh, the computer. Um, I could learn how to use my computer somehow, and I was able to just describe it to other people, and they all kept coming to me asking, how do you do this, how do you do that? And I um, you know, was so early on, this is right at the dawn of the computer age, that um, there were really not even classes taught in colleges or anything. So I I've, I've really feel like in my lifetime I've witnessed so much change and you know, going from where you know, almost no one even heard of a computer, let alone had one, to where you know, every person that you know has a smartphone, a computer. Um, these skills are, are so integral to everybody's life and allowing us to do such amazing new things that we couldn't do before, really allowing um, us to participate. I think, I think one of the changes in the, in the internet age is that it's the age of participation rather than the age of passive, passivity. And um, one of the things about, um, I think, traditional education is that it's gotten very standardized and there's a lot of focus on testing and a lot of focus on um, kind of making everybody good in every subject and get good grades. And there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of you pass or you fail. There's, there's really kind of um, something that's been stripped, which is initiative and just to be interested in learning new things. And so it's really kind of, a revelation to see that um, in this new age, this information age, that people participate in their own learning, and that um, you know some of the important uh, uh, avenues to get to that learning are offering like really great searchability and being able to filter and find and parse and um, dice and slice information and look at it really differently to serve all of these different needs. Um, and so that's uh, basically. I'm not going to take too long. I'm really excited to get into the discussion part of this, so I will pass the baton here. Thank you. My, name's Harry, my name is Harry Starn. I am the Associate Director for California Lutheran University's MBA in Financial Planning Program. And while they pull up my PowerPoint, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, our program. Um, 
We have been fully online since 2005. Our, our, our students range from early 20s to late 60s. 50% um, of our students are professionals already in the financial planning or wealth management, insurance, and accounting fields. The other 50% are career changers. Of those career changers, about 11% come out of the military. So we have men and women serving in the military, taking online courses, uh, many of whom have been uh, stationed in Iraq at the time that they're taking our programs. Um, what I'd like to do in my 12 to 15 minutes is, is just three different areas. I wanted to share with you the momentum that we're seeing as university providers of online uh, teaching. I wanted to also share with you what is now considered uh, the criteria for best practices in online teaching in an accredited online program. And third, what I see as the trends, uh, the challenges and the opportunities in the next five or ten years in this wonderful space. Now, last, um, see if I get to work, yes, last May I had the honor of going to St. Louis uh, to attend the U.S. DOA's award presentations. Our program received two national awards, but what jumped out at me and was, was quite amazing as I sat there in the award ceremony, 17 of the 37 awards went to programs aimed at kindergarten through 12th grade. And that was for programs and teaching. Programs like one uh, Chinese class in Oklahoma connected uh, synchronously, live, with, with another classroom in China. Another one where children across the United States were tuning in live to a presentation one hour before the NASA shuttle um, launch in which they could email questions to someone from NASA who was answering all their questions. To a situation where students come in, and I think it was, uh, this was a year ago when I was looking at this one, in which uh, they walk into, I think, an eighth grade science class. They'd go to their computers. One teacher would be in the room like a proctor. They would then run through all, the, all their um, online programs by themselves, taking quizzes, assessments, and, grade, and, and following their grade books. That's what's in the pipeline for us. Now, the Sloan Institute estimates that growth is going to be um, around 17 percent. I've seen the number about 20 percent for online learning. Edge Ventures said that by 2014, they expect that 20 percent of all students will be fully online. Not only that, there are many programs out there which are taking students who go to classroom and requiring them to perform somewhere between 25 or 35 hours towards their degree in an alternative uh, learning environment, whether it's blended learning where you go to some classes, then take online or online. So that's what we're seeing. Now, a couple of the drivers, I think, doing this is two. The perception about online learning is clearly changing. That's what we're hearing, and also work and career issues. And first of all, about the perceptions, there's a lot more comfort online. The, the, the old argument, well, online's not as rigorous, it's not as good as the classroom, that is clearly evaporating, and I hope to show you why in the next uh, section that I go through. And also, um, one wonderful thing about this is that our program, for example, is one of a very small handful of MBAs in financial planning. So we're getting students from across the nation because they're looking for that. They don't have that locally, and they're able to get into the programs they want with the instructors that they want. And we can also do the same with our instructors where we're pulling national people into our program where you could never get that group together. A wonderful thing about teaching online is that quite often the online classes I pull together are so rich with diversity and with knowledge, it's very difficult to always duplicate that from just the local community, especially over an extended period of time. Now, work and career issues. Last year at the um, uh, commencement ceremonies, uh, I think it was the convocation before that, the gentleman who was speaking for the graduates said uh, a quite interesting quote. He said at the end of his, his presentation, I wish you the very best in your first career. And I thought that was fabulous. And I'm going, wow, because when you look at it, the average careers for now is re going up to about three during people's lifetime. That's the projections. Now, to do those multiple careers, or and also to kind of stay current with maybe government regulations, maybe the learning that you need, you need access to information. And the way that they're going to be doing that is online. Why? Because you have families, you've got careers, you've got life 
going on. And the online can give you flexibility in doing that. Also, obviously, the time management issue. Well, let's move from there and let's talk about the current state of online uh, learning at the um, university level. Maybe. There we go. What I show here on this mind map are the criteria used by the U.S. Distance Learning Association when they're figuring out um, what they think are best practices. Notice there's four areas that, uh, th that are assessed. One is certainly the technology platform. And you already heard from one of the presenters, obviously, how key that platform is for the instructors. It gives us the capability to do a lot of different things. And part of the things we can do is the design. How do we lay out our weekly courses? What are the activities that we're offering? What are the interactions? And then, as you can see, the variety of activities um, then flow into what type of assessments, what type of feedback, how are we doing that and getting that back to our students. But notice that one branch up in the left-hand corner. The interaction is, in my opinion, the heart of online learning. As an instructor, my job is to try to maximize that because that's where the learning really takes off. It's not just student to the content. What's the content? Reading the books, listening to the lectures, maybe engaging in some other things, but it's now going beyond that where it's obviously student to content, student to instructor, but student to student. These dynamic Broadly diverse classrooms offer that component. And that's where, as a teacher, it really gets energizing. And as far as students, this is where it takes off, because you start to meld the theory with the practicum. They start to see how they can start using this tomorrow in their businesses. Now, in the next couple slides, and I know I need to move quickly, I just wanted to show you some examples of some of these branches. You've seen the words asynchronous, synchronous. So we're talking about things that have already been put there, you go and interact whenever you want to, and then the live events. And you can start to see where there's a crossover a little bit. Now, the discussion board, um, you know, is like a blog. You go in and you can do that. One of my students, I remember, I'll never forget her telling me the online environment was far superior in interaction than in a classroom. And I said, why is that? Because you would think maybe that's not the case. She said, classroom was one night a week three hours, maybe I met a couple people during the break. Here, 24-7, if I want to start to interact with people any time of the day or night, whenever I happen to like, you know, the student said she liked late nights, she could go late nights and she could interact. So you start to see how, as an instructor, um, what we can start to do is get people really engaged by offering a variety of different opportunities for interaction. Then you get into what else do I think when building, designing the course? You have preferred learning, learning modalities. And so what I need to be doing is offering a variety of different things. Act, activities, which for the visual learner, maybe someone who likes mind maps rather than just reading, someone who likes watching the audiovisual, uh, streaming voice, streaming video things. You start to get a sense here that within these online um, learning, an instructor, you have all the freedom in the world. When the technology guys offer you platforms to do things, you can start to mix and match. You can start to change the weeks. You can make them very interesting, very creative, and that drives a lot of energy, a lot of interest. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to show here uh, the resources. Obviously, part of it, we can pull in a lot of resources, uh, just like Linda's uh, wonderful database. You know, We can go to an online library and, and possibly have access to sources like that for our students. And finally, what I wanted to show you, this was one week. Just to give you a sense of what my classroom would look like, this happens to be a, a, the Moodle platform. There are many learning management systems. This is an open source. Uh, the, and you can see here that where you start to build some structure into the weeks, but within the structure, a variety of activities, changes slightly in week to week, different resources, but you can see some organization there that at this point in time I believe offers some comfort to the students because our students are still coming from the mindset we go to school there's walls around us we have a routine this offers a routine although we start to then bring in the creativity as you'll see in a couple slides I think down the road we'll start to move away from this organization but right now I like the comfort it, it allows people to get engaged feel like they are in a real classroom but they're doing it a little bit differently. Now, 
Um, where are we going in my last few minutes here? First of all, you've heard this one, okay? But clearly, this is the big trend. We're moving from e-learning to M learning. Electronic learning is eyeballs on the screen. You're sitting in front of a computer, basically hooked up to a high-speed uh, network for the most part. You're typing in information. You have headphones on. That is clearly becoming the dinosaur. The move is for anytime, anywhere. So we're talking about a very um, uh, high quality content with high connectivity via things like smartphones, tablet computers, any of the very portable um, uh, handheld devices. I think what that's going to do is drive the need for uh, voice recognition where you can be anywhere you want. And to be quite clear, um, I would be shocked if I saw you a year from now and said my discussion board was all typing and it wasn't just tidbits of streaming voice, streaming video, boom, 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 where it's real discussions. That's where we're going. So any, for any of you, you know, have an opportunity, participate in the mobile space, helping this move, it's a clear need, clear opportunity. The next one is, um, as you see the growth online, um, there's a need for faculty. I remember someone saying that um, they summed up their key to, to being profitable in life, and it came down to this. They, this person said, find a hole and fill it. Well, one of the holes right now are for qualified, motivated instructors to go online. I don't know why, but many instructors say, you know, I'm a classroom instructor, that's who I am, and I'm not interested in going there. And this is where we're going. I don't see there being a wall, but for some reason, some people do. So if you're interested in that, and notice 73% of faculty right now reported by the New York Times are adjunct faculty. The other thing which I think you're going to find is a need for databases um, where there'll be content experts who are willing to speak on a given week, a couple weeks, maybe for you know, compensation or some type of compensation where I can go and I'm teaching a course spanning eight weeks on an accelerated schedule. Some people are going 12 or, or excuse me, 11 or longer. Um, be able to call that person up and say, I want you to week, join us in week three. I want you to come in for 30 minutes and I want you to share this with my students. Now, the course really takes off. It's not just student to instructor, student to student, student to content. Now it's student to guest lectures. Students love this. It's hard right now for me to do it. Um, I try to bring in a couple of term because it's harder to find, but I think that's a need. Now, the last slide is tomorrow's classroom. And now we're getting a little bit more into the vague, but I clearly think that today's um, you know, structured classroom is going to change. I think it's going to become less structured. I think it's going to be where we come together, we're learning about a subject, we throw it out, the students start bringing in uh, information from a different source, the instructor is an instructor, but still a facilitator like you've heard up here before. And uh, also, outside of the university, classroom, global communities with a common purpose in learning where all of a sudden that who's the instructor, who's the student, it all changes. So I think um, um, th these are wonderful movements for learning what you want, coming together with people overseas in Asia, Europe, pulling together. Alternative technologies, clearly with the M, the move to M learning, uh, having elevated learning um, levels of digital uh, technology, streaming voice, streaming videos, and digital books. Right now, there's still resistance to the digital e-books, but classroom books keep going up and up and up, and I see they're going over $200 a book. And so at some point in time, as people get comfortable with the Kindles and all that sort, I, I clearly think we have to be moving in that direction. There's got to be better ways uh, of, of access, and I think you'll see that. Finally, combining entertainment with education, whether it's the virtual life, the second life type applications, which clearly can be brought in, whether it's 3D applications. I heard the other day that for gamers, they typically spend somewhere between 20 to 25 hours a week gaming. Now, that 20 to 25 hours a week, if that's in my classroom where it's fun and it's engaging and it's got real life applications, that gets exciting for me and for our students. So, that was me running through quickly the slides. Um, um, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you.
I, I will start with uh, a personal observation and then actually a set of questions for you and then, then dive into things. Uh, the, the observation is that it is both a blessing and a curse to be the caboose of this train. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the curse, quite frankly, is that the, the grading curve started really, really high and it just keeps going up. So that's depressing. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the blessing is that I can steal from these folks. <laughs> yeah. Now, what, what you've heard, I think, uh, over the, the last several conversations is, uh, you know, a very rich, exciting, dynamic environment that we have as people who care about learning. So before I get into that part, though, I have a couple of questions for you. How many of you are what I would call learning practitioners, learning professionals? You are engaged in the learning process in your organization, no matter where it is. By hands, please. Ah, quite a few. How many of you, and I'm only going to give you a binary answer here, by the way, this is a yes or no question. How many of you feel that technology is a blessing, a plus, in the learning experience. Okay, how many of you feel it's a curse? Couple, okay, I saw a couple of hands. Yeah, I know, and it's hard in this kind of audience, you're gonna go, I don't wanna really raise my hand too high. Uh, so these people will leap upon me and smite me. Now, uh, I, I have been living for 25 years in this bubble of technology and education, and I have to say I love it, but six or so years, about six years ago, I was seriously con contemplating a change, uh, a, a change in careers. I, I thought about the guy that drives the cart around the golf courses where they shoot the golf balls at, you know, any number of things. And the reason for that is I was bored. Quite frankly, I was bored. Um, we had been doing classroom teaching, and I love, I love being in front of a class. I love teaching. It, it, the endorphins that it releases are far better than any that I get in running, and if you look at me in profile, you'll notice that I don't do a lot of running. <laughs> So the bottom line is, while I love the experience of teaching, and, the th and I love technology, I felt that we were stagnant, that we did not have a lot of things, new things to do. And that has changed radically over the last few years. Instant messaging as a learning tool, texting as a learning tool, Facebook or social tools as learning environments, mobile devices that everyone has talked about and is and becoming ubiquitous, not just, by the way, in developed industrialized organizations. Go to India, go to China, go to Africa. The infrastructure doesn't support wired. It support, the, it, the only thing that will work, essentially, in those environments are wireless. Um, the iPad. I am not an Apple stockholder, but I love my iPad so much. <laughs> My wife stole the first one. I now, we now are, we're a two iPad family. Devices like these, infrastructure, and the challenges they produce are both intriguing to me now, they're fun, I've got a chance to try new things, and they're scary. For those of you that are sitting there looking at mobile learning, for those of you that are looking at collaborative or social or informal learning, uh, at, at any conference you, you could choose the name, if you put that in the title of your presentation, you're going to fill the room. Because people who care about learning are sitting there going, A, uh, first of all, what is it? And B, how am I going to do this? And, and probably more importantly, how am I going to make this work in a, in a manner that's effective and meaningful to my organization? What are the results going to be? What are the outcomes going to be? And these are tough questions, but they're fun questions, and they're questions we didn't have to deal with five or six years ago. So the good news is, is we're all pioneers. The bad news is we're all going to have some arrows in our back. But let's talk for just a moment about the, some of the things that you've already heard, and let's talk about them in the context, kind of a macro context, if, if you will. And we'll start, I think, with mobile. Um, mobile devices offer, I think all of us would agree, a tremendous frontier for the delivery of information, of learning, with some really significant challenges. Uh, if you're of my generation, even a screen that size is a challenge for me. Can you imagine having a very, very rich experience on a relatively small form factor? 
Well, it's possible that the screen resolutions on these things are, are getting better, but let's face it, you, you take my glasses away from me and I'm looking for a dog, not for one of these things. You know, I'm looking for someone to guide me. So we have generational challenges with devices. If you're building content for these things, you have a whole set of challenges that you have to address. And I, I suspect that Linda's got a team or, or a whole set of folks who look at that and look at what she has been delivering in the transition to these types of devices. And, and there are trade-offs, there are advantages and disadvantages. But the fact of the matter is, here's the, the, the blessing, if you will, is that a learning conversation, and I'm going to come to conversation and collaboration in just a moment, this can happen now anywhere at any time. And these things are essentially not just communication devices, they're connectors. And so the best instructor in the world on a, on a particular subject could, could now be literally in my pocket. And that is a tremendous thing. Leveraging it is going to be tough. Managing it is going to be tough. But great news, this is fun. This is fun and scary, OK? And the bigger form factor. The reason I love my iPad is I can see my iPad. <laughs> I can't get it in my pocket, but I can see my iPad. And, and the, uh, the touch-based interfaces, when you think about the idea of gestures and, and all this. Uh, I, you know, okay, I'm not 19 years old, um, but I picked it up pretty quickly. Um, I've handed my iPad to a four-year-old child and literally started to cry when this kid started whipping it out and just doing everything. So, Bottom line is we have new environments, new ways of delivering information, learning, and so this is a fun thing. This is a good thing. This is a blessing, ultimately. Challenge, but a blessing. Let's talk then about the idea of collaboration, of social learning. Um, I have, I have a, a premise that all learning is essentially social. Uh, and, and, and as a matter of fact, when you think about classroom learning, I, I used to talk about this in, in some of my presentations. You think about classroom learning, that's a relatively new mode, a new mechanism. In an agrarian society, did I say that right? Uh, looking at the academics on the panel going, it, it, you know, in a, in a society in which we were in, in farms, we were separated by pretty far distances from large groups of people. We learned from one another, the person standing next to you in the field. When you moved into the industrial age, my, uh, my father-in-law is a wonderful man, 96 years old, spent most of his life on a General Motors assembly line. Uh, and he looks at me, he does not understand in, in any way, shape, or form what it is I do, but he, he, you know, I will ask him questions from time to time and just revel at the answers. Because I asked him at one point, how did you learn? And you know, when he got past that, that puzzled look that he always gets when I talk to him, and he said, what do you mean? How did I learn? How did you learn to do what you did? You did this successfully for years and years and years. You, you fed your family, you created a life for your uh, for your family, you sent a daughter to graduate school who now is really ruining my life. So, so how did all this work? How did you learn to do what you did? And he said, I, w w I watched the guy next to me. So learning has been social and it has really been social to you know, almost a one-to-one -one ratio for ages. And it wasn't until we started to build big buildings and big campuses and big universities and big schools and start stuffing people into them that we started to get the idea that we can throw all these folks into a room and we put the sage on the stage. And the manner in which we learned morphed. It changed from me sitting next to Harry and saying, that was an interesting idea. What did, how did you do that to Harry getting up in front of the class and sharing it with all of us. But it became a more one-dimensional conversation, didn't it? Harry, can't, if, if he's got 40 or 50 or 300 students in a classroom, it's very difficult to have a dialogue with him. So we went from a very tight, almost one-to-one -one ratio in learning, a social model at its very core, to one that still had social aspects, but became more one-dimensional. Now, now we have a whole set of tools, technology tools, some of whom you like and some of whom you don't, that allow us to go back to more of that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I will pick on instant messaging for just a moment, if I may. Uh, you know, if, if, go to any business and ask the, in, the IT people about instant messaging. What are your policies about instant messaging? How do you manage it? They will, in most cases, wrinkle their noses 
and they may even uh, you know, wheel away from you and sprint down the hall because they don't like this idea. This is a hard to control medium. Why? Because the leadership of most organizations think that instant messaging is a, to is a toy, not a tool, that it, is it would be employed for easy. Where do you want to go to lunch today? Did you see the suit that Harry's, wear that Harry's wearing today? You know, any number of tie, excuse me, uh, or, or whatever. And I didn't mean to pick on you. I really didn't. Uh, but, but the bottom line is they think that that's not going to happen. But this idea of a mobile device and instant messaging means that I can connect with any one of you, no matter where you are, assuming that we're both awake at the same time, and have a dialogue, have a conversation. And that conversation, in many instances, is a learning experience. It's a learning conversation. That is a tremendous, tremendous change. And, it, and a tool like instant messaging and a mobile device, or even on your computer, recalibrates the calculation down to one to one or one to many. It can still be, actually, it should be many to many in many instances. And when we talk, we've, you've already heard about things like um, wikis and blogs and a lot of other tools that allow a lot of us to have that conversation en masse and exchange ideas. But at the core of this is it's a conversation. It's a collaborative exercise. If, to, to me, if learning isn't collaborative, I'm, I am of the ilk that if I'm not engaged with you, and, and you did a wonderful job, both, a, a lot of you did a wonderful job of talking about the interaction and the engagement. If that does not happen, I'm not learning. I'm, I will tune you out. I will tune out, period. And I love to read, but that's a form of learning that I have very specialized needs for and I, and I focus on. But when I really want to learn, when I really want to change a behavior, when I want to get passionate about something because I see someone else's passion, that's a conversation for me. That is very much a conversation for me. And we now have these tools, these wonderful tools, one of whom might be from a company that I happen to represent. But never mind what, where you get it, the fact of the matter is you can be using a whole wealth of tools that previously and just a few years ago weren't there. The challenge for you, I think, the challenge for all of us, is to put this into a coherent whole. How do we make all of this work? How do we show the value of it in our organizations, whether we are in an educational institution or in a business? Uh, and how do we, I don't I want to say manage, how do we integrate these tools into the DNA of our organizations? That's the big challenge. That's the thing that I think over the next couple of years that we will all be talking about. It's not that are these tools of any use, because whether we like it or not, they are there. They are in our social lives, our personal lives, and they are migrating very rapidly into our business and our, and our, our learning lives. So now it becomes a, a matter of how do I integrate this? How do I put all of this stuff together? Those of you that figure this out in your roles will become golden because the IT folks, for the most part, are going to not want to engage with it because it means more work. And, and I used to be an IT guy, and I, I can speak for that from, from experience. You know, it's more work. It's more threat. The, you know, the idea that someone can get into my network from one of these, from anywhere in the, in the world, this is not a good thing to an IT person. It's going to be the learning people in an organization, the people who care about this process, who bring it in, who nurture it, and who help direct it. And so I envy you that challenge and the fun that you're probably going to have. I don't envy you the stress it's going to create, the battles you'll have to win. But think of it this way. You could be driving one of those carts around the golf course <laughs> with the golf balls coming in at you. I'll still probably end up there. But for now, I'm happy that I'm not doing that. I'm happy that I'm here, that I'm happy at, at this table with these people and, and, and able to engage with you and listen to your questions. So, I'm done. Again, to remind everyone of our format, I'm going to ask a, just a couple, few questions of the panel, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. There'll be two people in the room that'll have microphones, and when you have a question, just get your hand up. Uh, we'll get you a microphone. You can ask your question. I want to return uh, back to this uh, idea of where do we see, what is the future of online teaching and learning? 
Uh, the question was kind of five to 10 years. I don't think anyone knows what's gonna happen in 10 years. So let's go back uh, from today to the next five years out. And um, appreciate Bob's comment on the, this idea that uh, internet in your pocket is a big deal. There's a fascinating article uh, last month's Wired Magazine, The Death of the, of the Web, and uh, tracking the type of activity that's happening over the internet and that uh, in the last six or seven years in that range, we've seen browser market share drop from a high of 61% to 23% and declining rapidly. And there's all sorts of other activities that are, are happening as a result of that. Uh, another piece of information, I just want to get those two things in front of you and then you kind of dialogue about that from your perspective, business or institution. Well, when my father graduated from college, he was told that the job that he would get would be the job that he would retire from. I graduated in college in 1985, and I was told that the, I would have approximately nine different careers or jobs in, in my professional lifetime. Uh, we're reading now that the average college graduate will have between 14 and 19 jobs with one stint international. As we think of how dynamically the world is changing, from your particular institution uh, or business, what's the role that online learning and teaching can play in addressing this rapidly changing world uh, that we're kind of this global neighborhood that we're all entering into at, at a breakneck speed? Well, I, I think um, Brian really addressed it in that it's so easy to update something that's in the cloud or something that's dynamic as opposed to something that's fixed. And so um, I think it's a, a really uh, important method to distribute information just because, and relevant, because it can be updated so much more quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. You no, know, it would certainly be one thing that's positive, but it, it, distribution is one part of the puzzle. When you think of learning, we think of, go back to learning between students and students, learning between student and content, uh, and you have your 50 some thousand pieces of content, uh, and then um, learning in the sense of uh, with the, the faculty member themselves, and obviously on your content pieces, probably the richness is a way to perhaps establish connection with your instructor or your author. Uh, I just think if we look at all three of those pieces, the rapid change that's happening and the fact that the internet is moving smaller and smaller and onto devices that you know, two years ago didn't exist, you know, what are the implications for that for your business or for your institutions? I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's a leveler. I think access, the technology uh, and, and access to online learning is, is a leveler. I'll give you one. Very, I'll try to make this as succinct as possible. An example, um, about two years ago, roughly two years ago, I was in India. Uh, I spent two weeks in the country. A fascinating, fascinating experience. And uh, was uh, able to meet with the premier of a, a province. I guess he was a premier. He, he owned the province. Uh, a rural, rural province in which children as young as four or five, six years old were walking 30 kilometers one way to another village to sit in a room with a teacher, with an instructor who had something to teach them. In India, the second, uh, the, the only thing that they spend more money on, uh, the average family spends more money on than education is food. Housing is behind education. They value this tremendously. And these children were walking sometimes in very dangerous environments for 30 kilometers just to sit in a room and learn something because that was that was the leveler. That was the, that actually, not the leveler, that was the ladder. That's the step up. By uh, the, the company I was working for at the time engaged with this province and started to build tiny little classrooms of about 10 by 20, 20 by 20, with very, very inexpensive furniture, a screen, a projector, one computer, and a connection to a synchronous learning environment, a microphone in the room, and powered, oh, and, and a wireless connection powered by either solar or bicycles. And what that meant, though, to the children in that community is that in, in India, the educational system is very entrepreneurial. 
And so a marketplace is springing up in India of people who can teach, teach algebra, teach physics, teach auto repair, teach anything. And they sign up into this large marketplace. And then the parents of those students will buy a class. And those kids can now sit in a class rather than walk along a dangerous road, they can sit in a class and learn from an instructor. Uh, and the tools are very rudimentary, but they can learn. They can have an, an engagement with someone who has something to share with them. That's, when you talk to the premier, when I, when I was able to talk to the premier at the latter parts of our pilot project, he was almost in tears. It, this, this was a, an individual who really cared about the welfare of his constituents, his people. And he said that this, this is the changer. This is the game changer. My province, my nation, in, in 10 years, with the use of things like this, will be far better off. We will be better citizens. We will be more prosperous. We will be safer. And it's on the back of education. In this particular instance, online education, uh, an ability to, to get learning that wasn't possible before. So I got this kind of all altruistic, you know, kumbaya thing going on there. But I do think that even in the most dire circumstances, it can be the not just the great leveler, but the up leveler, the, 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 the what's, I use the term ladder. I think it's, that's it. Yes. Bruce. I'm just gonna add, um, I think in answer to this question, um, where are we in five, 10 years, it's gonna change the, na the nature of faculty culture, I think significantly, because students are gonna demand that their classroom environment is as up to date as the last MSNBC headline they saw on their way into classroom. And for research faculty, you know, a lot of their energy is spent doing their cutting edge research, but there's property intellectual rights that have to get published through a scholarly journal. They can't share that immediately. Part of it belongs to the university. But their students are going to demand that. And then for those of us who, like at Antioch, we use practitioner faculty who have their businesses or their um, practices, they're working full time and teach for us in the evenings. So it's going to ask a faculty to stay on the front edge of their own learning so that they can keep their class on the front edge. And tied to that is their own comfort with technology, which some people, you know, I have all these devices, I have an iPad, but they're all set on the standard settings and I don't know what to do to make them do things better. I know many of you in the room could make these things do amazing things, but I can turn them on and use them, kind of. But then in addition, they have to work. I was house sitting for a friend last night and I went to log on with my laptop. So picture this, I have my laptop, go to log on, she's given me all the passwords for the damn wireless, except it asked for a device ownership password which I couldn't find. So then I got my iTouch out to look up her phone number, called her on my cell phone to see, got her voicemail. So then I used my iPad, went onto the 4G, Googled how do you get around device ownership password, and a half hour later I was finally on the internet. But technology has to work. And so the problem is if we're really gonna move education to these devices, they better be working 24 seven. We better have a help desk available 24 seven and the server better not go down or else it all comes to a screeching halt. <laughs> one, one thing that I, that I found and it's interesting when we take a look at why someone's coming to the university for the degree and you would think well it's for career advancements for needs and it's amazing how many people it's for self uh, uh, fulfillment self actualization something they've always wanted to do something they're interested about so now you're having a very mixture of people coming in and you and and because it's so varied and where they are in their life experience technology experience you have to offer the content whether they want it um, in one of the small devices where they want it online and and many of the people because they have that focus on they want to learn this they've always wanted to learn it there's the practical aspect and we sort of pull that in so i hope, hope that answered that's very good very good um yes yeah, one of the one of the directions that uh that i see this going and in some ways you know talking about online education if, if not already so i think it's the term is going to become very passe uh, I think if you ask students today how much time do you spend online, they will get a very puzzled look because when are they not online? You know, they're carrying these devices with them all the time. Um, and so what we're going to end up with is a very resource-rich learning environment. 
And I think that is going to be the context in which we're looking at different approaches to learner-led activities, which are going to drive things like how do you chunk up learning into the sizes that are appropriate to what the learner intends, uh, but also in terms of how that drives uh, instructor-mediated experiences too. What sorts of activities can occur in this environment in all of the different facets, and I think the um, uh, the mobile or online aspect of it is going to fade in terms of whether that's a significant distinguishing factor between one approach or another. Well, as you think about this entrepreneurial edge that uh, online learning and teaching represents, uh, think about your organizations and, you know, as new, Bob kind of referred just a little bit there, perhaps the resistance of IT to, to move into this space. But if we wanted to change that, uh, speak about it a little more positively, I mean, new things are happening. And uh, Linda, you might have a comment on this and that, you know, you were delivering your uh, resources via primarily a browser. And I know lynda.com is now available on iPhone and in the Android space. Uh, that's as much as probably a technical conversation within your organization, perhaps as much as it is a, a change management. It's a different sort of thing. And is and I often don't think of educational institutions necessarily being huge places of entrepreneurship. You might have it in pockets, but for a whole institution to be moving quickly and rapidly to, to keep up with the, the rapid change that we're seeing, how do you uh, kind of work within your organizations to facilitate and encourage this entrepreneurial edge so that you can kind of stay current with user preference for how content is consumed? Well, I think for lynda.com, it's our core business. So mm. it's, uh, I think for traditional educational uh, institutions, it's, it's a far bigger challenge because there is, has never, it's so new and there has never been a built-in structure to support it. And, um, and it's very complicated, and I would say that it's one of our biggest challenges, and it is our core business. And that, um, you know, it's really daunting to stay on top of everything and, and innovate and invent. And um, what's great is that there are a lot of different resources, and I, I think that Alan was touching on this, that there's just a lot of choice um, out there. And, and so is Brian about all the different LMSs and, um, and different resources that are out there, and it's it's probably not going to be any one solution. I think um, I think it's going to be a hybrid of lots and lots of different types of services. And just like um, I was just saying this today, that one of the most searched for courses on Lynda.com, it really shocked us, um, was WordPress. And when we started Lynda.com, blogging hadn't even been invented. So um, you know, you really have to stay agile and adaptable to um, uh, be aware of what all of the new trends are and all of the new resources. And you know, things like WordPress and Joomla and Drupal, those are turnkey systems where you don't have to know a line of code. Well, maybe in uh, Drupal you have to know a line of code. But you know, the the promise is that you don't have to be very technical to publish to these types of systems and types of services. And so I think um, it will take education where it's not the primary business driver, a lot more focus and, and financial commitment to be able to innovate and stay on top. And I think for us, it's our core business. So we better, you know, we know that if we don't adapt, that um, someone else will come along and adapt, you know, and, and beat us to the punch. So it's very important to us. Invention in higher ed. Someone's from higher ed's got it. What how, you you're working in with your where you're collaborating across um, multiple areas within UCSB. Uh, that certainly would bump up against this entrepreneurial edge or this invention uh, on how do we interdisciplinary cooperation, which is really an academic question, but then the sharing of content and making it available. You start to get into that technical area. How do you bring those two together in ways that really benefit students? Well, I think from a real practical standpoint, um, our focus has been on supporting innovation by faculty. Um, I think that, you know, as I said before, there are, uh, there are a whole range of possible uses of the same technologies and which ones are appropriate for a given discipline or a you know, topic area. It varies uh, wildly and comfort level from an individual faculty 
Uh, you know, it also is something that uh, varies uh, quite a bit. Um, one of the things that um, pretty consistently um, uh, comes up is the uh, uh, is the tension between uh, student drivers and faculty drivers, and I think that this is one of the areas where the wide range of education, of uh, teaching and learning experiences, is going to really come to bear. I think what may be the core uh, business for a research institution is going to be very different from a, the core business of a certificating institution or something that is being responsive to, uh, uh, to life learning type experiences. And I think that it's not at all going to be one size fits all. It'll be very interesting to see which technologies get used in which settings in which ways. And so I think from, from our current experience, we're trying to be agile and be evaluative of what is actually occurring and what things are working and what things are not. I think it's very hard in a fundamentally conservative institution like, in, uh, like uh, academia to feel comfortable trying things that don't necessarily work. Um, and I think that uh, that's probably one of our biggest challenges uh, because, of course, if something doesn't work, then you have a classroom filled with students who feel like they uh, uh, didn't get exactly uh, what they should have. One interesting um, example of that, and a real important thing, from a, again, from a practical standpoint, is in setting expectations appropriately. Um, there was a course uh, being offered. Uh, I'd said that there wasn't much distance ed, ed, um, interest at UCSB. The exception is as a uh, topic for research. And so there was a course that was offered both as a hybrid course with an online component, but also as a straight distance ed course. And this happened pretty much at the same time that the UC system-wide initiative got some press in uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, and at the same time there was a lot of press about uh, budget cuts across UC. And in that context, uh, the students in the online version of the course um, had the same experiences with the, uh, as with the students in the hybrid course for the uh, online components but they rated their uh, class experience much, much lower because based on the context, they were assuming that they were getting an online course as a cost savings measure, as a response to budget cuts. And in that context, they had the same experiences of the technology mostly worked, but with a glitch here or there that was accepted in the hybrid course. It was a real irritant for the students in the course that was an online only course. And so I think as we're looking at innovation, a real important factor is setting expectations for the learners. And that, you know, in a classroom setting, that's, that's not an issue. People know what to expect in a traditional classroom. In online learning, we need to set those expectations so that we can meet them. Well, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from, uh, from everyone here. And if you raise your hand, we've got a couple microphones. Why don't we... Uh, Guy, go right here. So let's say I'm sold on online learning, and um, I'm a consultant, and I teach workshops, and I say maybe some of these could be done more in an online fashion and reach a wider audience. How does one learn how to give an online learning course? Is there an online course for that? <laughs> And I assume there's maybe not yet, so I would like to understand from the panel, how would you learn to do something like that, to get good at, at, at teaching a, an online course? I'll take a stab at that. Um, so when I was at Pacifica and they, I was going to teach online, there actually was a couple day seminar that they put us through where they taught us about online pedagogy. We were definitely introduced to the software and kind of run through our paces. And then, thank God for manuals with screenshots, they sent us home with one of those. Um, once you do it a few times, it gets easier. Now that I'm in charge of faculty and needing to train them, uh, we're very blessed at Antioch with having some online instructional designers. And there's actually people who specialize. I'm sure Linda has an entire staff of them. Um, 
that specialize in how do you chunk information. You have to chunk it differently. You have to think about visual versus auditory versus kinesthetic. So you, if you take someone who's taught a traditional course, it's, they say it takes about 10 hours to convert an hour of teaching into an online environment because you have to think of it differently and frame it differently. So that's why it's a little pricier to do it on the front side, but once it's done and it's loaded into a shell, that shell can be moved over into every time you teach the course. But there are people who specialize in this, and I've taken, uh, on our campus, it's Katie Golis, and um, she has amazing examples that just blow your mind of what can be done in the online environment. And so we have different levels of training for our faculty from the newbies, like how do you just use the basic tools of uploading a syllabus and having a discussion and using the calendar to you really want to just do dynamic, engaging online experiences. And then we have some faculty who are very comfortable teaching that way. They not only teach for us, but other people, and they're mentoring other faculty. We're opening up some of the Sakai sites so faculty can look in and see what other sites look like. So in itself, it becomes a collaborative thing. And yes, some pieces of it are online. to um, making an online presentation and um, you know at the most basic there are tons of different webinars that you see online and if you go look at some of them they're they're fairly basis they're basic they're just somebody either showing PowerPoint slides and and with a voiceover or talking so there's a lot of variation but there also are the principles in giving a good presentation and some of it has to do with story arc some of it has to do with um, you know typography how you use type, how you do composition, how you um, edit video if you have video, and, and we do teach courses on all of those types of things. So there's, there's part of it is making a compelling presentation that has nothing to do with whether it's online or offline, and the other part is what technology are you going to use to deliver that online presentation. And, and there are many turnkey systems as well as custom, you know, published to YouTube, published to your own website, and probably just looking around at what other consultants and um, you know different uh, people are using on their own websites would yield some different systems that are out there. I'd like to share how I, how I uh, learned how to teach online. And there was a book written in the 50s called um, How to Read a Book. Not a good title, right? <laughs> and, and, and in it, he had something called syntopic research. And the gentleman said, what you do is you get, uh, go to the library and get 10 or 12 books on the subject you want. And you'll see the commonality. Everyone's going to have the same themes, so you know they're kind of the knowledge, you know? And then everyone has their own ingredient, like, like making a pie, not a pie, but making some dinner. And I thought that was very useful. Well, I'm sure today, uh, for example, people coming in the program to teach adjuncts, I'm providing that to them. So there must be sources right now to make it easier. By the way, I, I decided to, I, I like that book so much, I, I, re, I said I was going to read it to my son at bedtime every night, and, my, and that did not go over real big in the household. It was not my best uh, decision, as they say. <laughs> but anyway, I hope that helped. Right, thank you. Um, one additional suggestion, if I may. Um, anybody that sells a tool for this stuff is going to inundate you with um, webinars and things like that. You may not want to be on the mailing list, but there's usually some pretty good content there. And, and there are a number of people, both in academia and in the business world, who have done this, uh, have really built, in some instances, careers and businesses on the art and the science of being effective online. So there's actually quite a bit, I think, of, uh, of help and assistance there. It's not too difficult to find. Um, and so uh, a Google search and then, you know, check out a vendor that, uh, that has a tool like this and that'll lead you to kind of a jumping, you know, a, an island hopping scenario where you can see a lot of this information. Thank you. Sure. Now someone has a microphone. Yes. Is it on? It's on. <laughs> First of all, this is so exciting to me as a person who loves learning, and I think it's going to turn America on its ear, probably the world, but in America, basketball stars make the money, uh, movie stars, rock stars, Lady Gaga, and I think with what's happening here, you are creating the legends of tomorrow, and they are going to be teachers that are able to incorporate all these skills. I just don't know how you begin in your individual institutions to find the TEDx quality instructors all over the world to come to you and, and work for you. And will you ultimately all coordinate and will it all be one great big classroom? It's fantastic. And I just have to ask, Linda, can you fast forward in a class? 
Oh yeah, and you can click in a nonlinear fashion too and not even watch it in order. And you can combine different classes. It's however you want to learn. Um, I, I think that you raise a really good point and I think it, it is, um, I, one thing that I wanted to talk about in my introduction that I forgot was that in the beginning when we offered lynda.com to educators, they were very threatened by it because it was like, why would somebody come to my Photoshop course that I'm teaching $300 a semester for if they can get your 30 Photoshop courses on lynda.com for $25 a month? And what they realized was that it was um, to have the different voices from lynda.com and offer it to their students, it actually liberated them from the rote teaching and allowed them to perform something different um, than being the sage on the stage. And that's more of a mentor and, some, and a teacher who can work with students on student projects and project-based learning. And, in, and instead of, uh, I think we're seeing a real shift and it's gonna be hard for uh, traditional educational institutions to adapt to this. And the shift is, is that we're going away from localized experts to having experts in the cloud and the very best expert in the cloud. And so it's going to radically transform what teachers in the classroom do. And I think we're going to find that teachers who can relate more to students, who are more hands-on with students, who are more um, you know, collaborative with students, and help, can help students to learn to learn as opposed to teaching them the information, um, that those are going to be the more successful institutions in the future. It's, it's definitely a huge disruptive paradigm shift that is you know, not going to be pretty. It's, gonna, it's going to um, help as many teachers as it's, or probably hurt more teachers in the traditional uh, context of you, know, you were hired as the expert in this topic to come and teach this. Um, but I also think that there is an opportunity, a really transformative opportunity for teachers to have a very different, more important role than being the transmitters of the expertise. And that more important role is being the role of a mentor and someone to support, encourage, and inspire learning. And that's something that really isn't happening enough today. Yeah. I, I think that's a, that's a tremendous point because I think the mentor-based learning is uh, certainly, in my experience, the most exciting part of what goes on. And I think that uh, working, uh, you know, working at a university when you see that light in people's eyes when they're explaining what they do and why they're so excited about that and having that be something that a student experiences, you know, that is the core of what's going on. And that's something that there's not an obvious technology to replicate yet. Now, there are lots of pieces that, uh, that get parts of that done, and I think that's an area where the technology really has to grow because I think that's the core of the experience that is going to carry through as the technology changes. So I think that's a, a really important you know, target for us to continue to be looking at. Okay, thank you. Right here in the front. Um, this touches a little bit on what uh, Bob was saying. When the first um, young child of a goat herder in Namibia accesses all the physics classes online from MIT and all of the math classes from Virginia Tech and cherry picks the best of all of them and then qualifies for a four-year degree in condensed matter physics. Um, how will that child test out? What degree, what university will give them a degree? Does it matter? And how disruptive will that be? Mm -hmm. I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I think that's going to be a huge challenge for most institutions of higher learning because what they are currently marketing is an entrance fee to then get a degree from them with their stamp on it with their faculty. Um, Antioch has already struggled with this a little bit because we've always been the group that focused with um, adult learners and we were the first university in the country to admit women, the first to admit minorities. We've always been on kind of the cutting edge of progressive education. And so one of the things that we're known for is for years we've given prior experiential learning credits. So if someone can bring to us and demonstrate learning that they did outside of a classroom but it's equivalent to classroom learning, we give them credits for it. And I think more and more universities are going to have to adopt a model where they're not going to have to be so, um, you know, trying to own education 
but more paths to education and be open to different paths. Um, even so many people who are homeschooled now, and, and whether we have paths that allow that to be easily documented in admissions to universities and graduations versus not. You know, universities are already struggling with this, but I think it's gonna just blow the top off when you're right. Somebody can come and say, I've, I've done all this academic work, and, and, but it wasn't for credit. Can I get credit for it now? What is that gonna look like? But I think there's something else that happens in school that can't easily happen online. And, the, and that child is not learning social skills. They're not learning how to collaborate and how to um, work with teams and how to cr have critical thinking and how to have good judgment. And that's not really, uh, I mean, it's book learning. Maybe it's not a book. Um, it's facts. But I think what is becoming a very important currency is emotional intelligence currency. And that's something that really can happen at the classroom level so much better than it can happen online because it requires true interaction between people. And that's very highly prized in the workforce. Um, you know, when you find somebody who comes into the workforce who only knows how to deal with facts but doesn't know how to deal with people, um, they're not going to survive very long. So I really think that we could shift our emphasis from all of the rote fact-based learning, and that really could happen very easily online, but what we could do better in the classroom is teach the soft skills and the social skills and the, and the interacting with each other kinds of skills, which are hugely critical today. Hello, I have a, a question concerning um, opportunities and obstacles regarding uh, K-12 to public education, and if any of you all have any experience or interest or are aware of initiatives in that regard, online learning opportunities. Um, well, I, th I think one of the real opportunities is for distance learning, whereby there's an instructor at some distant location communicating to multiple classrooms. Um, I hope this is, is addressing your answer. That's one of the models that you certainly see. So, you know, when you get into the vocabulary, when you talk about distance learning per se, at least right now, that's what they're talking about. So now you have um, a rural, rural area in the United States that that can't man for a Chinese class, but you can have one Chinese instructor in one of the major cities broadcasting across. So that's a real opportunity right now. Um, and that's, that's the biggest model that I see being used. Is anyone else? No, there are actually some very intriguing things going on, and I've, I've completely blanked on the, uh, the program. Uh, but there's a school district uh, just north of Detroit, relatively um, not well-to-do, but, but not a poor school district that, whose superintendent has convinced the state education board to essentially take all of the, the bindings off. And he is now partnering with schools in China. His students are learning Mandarin. They are learning them from instructors in China. And they are, and his faculty are teaching those equivalent students in China on there. This is an international curriculum. It is extraordinary. He had to get unbelievable amounts of, of uh, I guess you would say, permissions from the state to even do this, to consider taking a, ch uh, a Chinese teacher and essentially accrediting him to, to teach in this thing. But that kind of environment, while it is very, very rare, is I think going to be increasingly, is certainly possible today. It's going to be increasingly uh, interesting to see more and more um, school systems uh, adopting this, and it's not going to be out of the big schools. It's not. It's not going to be out of the big states with the huge budgets. It's going to be in an individual environment, an individual district, where one f innovative leader with a host of people who are willing to follow, and parents who will buy into it, and school boards and all those kinds. Of, that that whole idea, I think, is extremely exciting, and it's just little dots on a map that are going to start to interconnect. Oh, and by the way, in, Philado in Philadelphia, I think there's an online high school. I'm not sure if it's grade school, but that's pretty much, I think, their target. I'm not sure the business model that they have, but I think it's targeted for the homeschool market, where those students can come, participate in online classes through that high school, and, and get some of the things to augment the, the homeschooling. So there might be some opportunities you know, for that sort of model. You know? I, I have a right back here. Oh, okay. I really appreciate 
So on all of the discussion, uh, a question really is on the instructor. I, I still feel the instructor is a very important part of the learning experience, despite the medium that's used and the broad base of knowledge that's created. And just from my own experience, instructors quite often, just like managers, are used to doing the same thing over and over again. So students may see the same, same article on a subject that is 10 years old. And not that the content is wrong or the points are wrong, but it's something, as a student looks at it, it's just something that's old or not up to date. On the other side, when they're given assignments or research, they're sort of given some examples and they're put out there. With all the sources that are available, they come to a point where they keep drilling and drilling and drilling to find out what's really important. And with four or five classes, they ultimately say, I can't do this anymore. So, uh, my point is from the instructor and the importance of the, the instructor. How does the instructor guide both by up-to-date examples of information and at the same time pointing out the resources that are most effective for the student to make their decisions and get their learning? I'll take that. Okay. For, first of all, I, I agree. The instructors are absolutely paramount. They're the, they are the, the person setting the expectations, uh, sending out the broadcast letter in the beginning, setting the whole culture from the class in week one. And week one is incredibly important. Now, when working with adjuncts um, uh, who are coming in to work, what I'm looking by the second time they start uh, managing the course and, 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 and um, um, running that, start taking ownership per se, to start updating the articles, keeping them relevant. Sometimes I've come across, uh, I remember there was a couple of articles from the 90s which were wonderful case studies. I couldn't find them since. But then you start getting the comments like, you know, when, when this was written, I was like 10 years old or f five years old. And so you have to frame it too, saying like, but for the most part, you're absolutely correct. And you, we have to keep this information fresh. Uh, obviously, um, you might be supporting with textbooks, but you're bringing in the practitioner items. So what you're saying is, is incredibly important. That the, and I know, Alan, you, you feel the same way. The instructor, you have wonderful capabilities. You've built platforms and resources, but it's the instructor that pulls it all together, frames the items, replaces the items that needs to be done, and, and um, manages discussions, encourages the discussions. And, and really, when you teach online, I think about it like you're pushing that energy right through the computer, and the students feel it. Is, where does that sound? It's really true. Well, I think you're absolutely right that the teacher is paramount and that, um, but to me this is again one of the really fundamental shifts that is happening right now. When you can memorialize a talk, there's no reason to give it multiple times. And so it really changes what a teacher is needing to focus on. And, you know, delivering the same lecture year after year, um, it should be, that's going to be obsolete. I mean. Perhaps some people are getting away with doing that today, but that will not exist in the future. And so I think, you know, it goes back to the whole sage on the stage that that's no longer necessarily the teacher's role. And I think if teachers, uh, for, for one thing, myself as a teacher, I think one of the hidden benefits of being a teacher is that you get to be a student. And whenever you're going to learn new material to teach new material, that's the joy and that's really the craft of being a teacher. And so if you're so set in your ways that you're not practicing that craft, you're, you're kind of cheating one of the, you know, yourself out of this great benefit of learning new things. And you're definitely not, you're going to be obsolete because I don't think that type of teaching is going to exist in the future. Future. I would say that this allows us to keep our faculty fresh too. Like I have some faculty, one of my faculty right now, she's an international business consultant. She works with companies all over the world on intercultural communication issues. Well, she teaches our intercultural communication course. And every week she's writing her students from Paris and from Africa and from South America. And, but she's able to engage with them and keep the material. And the fact that she, she'll literally say, hey, I just came out of a meeting with this company. This was the issue. What do you all think? So I feel like our university is enriched because we now since she doesn't have to be tied to Santa Barbara for 10 weeks in a row to teach for me, I can have her on our faculty and she can still be globetrotting, which is amazing. And the only thing that I would add to that is that this doesn't necessarily come easily to everyone and so institutionally there has to be a commitment to support the effort as well. Uh, and I think that's absolutely paramount. Right, right here we have... I wanted to thank the panel. You guys are, gave us a tremendous overview of the online learning universe. My specific question has to do with, with um, more of a business question. I'm, I'm evaluating the viability of uh, online courses 
for very narrow business segments. Maybe, you know, specifically in my case, farmers, but you know, maybe a universe of 100 people, maybe a universe of, 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 of less than that. Would that work? Does that work? Is that something that, that, that lynda.com would be interested in doing? Or are there competitors or companies similar to lynda.com that, that, that would do this type of um, very narrow segment uh, coursework? Um, well, we're very broad, so that probably wouldn't work with, for, uh, for us and also our focus is on technology. Um, but there absolutely are, um, you know, numerous systems out there kind of, I was talking about the blogging software. There are lots of publishing platforms, everything from, you know, YouTube to um, Adobe Connect comes to mind, even GoToMeeting, I think you have a tool that records. Um, why, yes, we do. Why, yes, you do. Um, and so I think there are tons of ways to publish the, the education. Um, figuring out how to monetize it and how to make a business out of it is a whole other topic. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, you can always hire production companies. If you, it's all about budget, I suppose. If, if it's something you're going to do grassroots yourself for free or if it's something that you're going to try to make money doing. We are, we are rapidly running out of time, and we have time for actually one last question. And uh, it'll be here in the back. A business question. Harry, you touched on it briefly, and it's up there on alternative technologies, the classroom for tomorrow. In the world we're at today with the universities having their, uh, their bookstores, the foundations, et cetera, that generate a lot of revenue off of textbooks, and then the publishers and the authors, authors being professors, uh, do you see any pushback from academia to the actual student who is the user of, uh, I think the students are ready today to pick up their textbooks via e-digital, e e-books, et cetera. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, with textbooks costing 200, maybe a download of a textbook, $30. No, I haven't seen the pushback, at least from my perspective. But I'm amazed that some of the students are not embracing the e-books yet, saying they like the feel that they want to get into books, they want to highlight and everything, but the price is such that I just think we have to be going in that direction. And whether or not anyone's upset about it, you know, um, the costs of education keep going up, and somewhere there's got to be relief. And that's one area that makes perfect sense to me, and that's why I brought that up. But okay, anyone else? Well, I would just add, as an author, I have a textbook, and my publisher sells it at wholesale cost for 30 bucks. The bookstore marks it up $10. And of that 30, I make 10%, so I get like two bucks a book. They have an e-book available, which is PDFs of the entire book. You can buy it chapter by chapter, buy the whole book. They sell it to the student for the wholesale price, but my royalty then drops 50% down to 6% of that book. So it's interesting, the publisher is saving the printing and, and shipping costs. The author's work was the same. And, and then, of course, after the first edition is sold, neither the publisher nor the author get anything, but the bookstore can resell that book multiple times. And so the bookstore actually makes the most money on the book, especially if they do used books. So the biggest problem with this whole issue and why textbooks are driven up is the used book market. If we could have that issue solved, it would, it would be better. But right now, online books don't come in a Kindle or an iPad format where you can affect the type and stuff. You get PDFs. And for most people, looking at a PDF on a screen, when you go columns of small text, it's easier to print it out and work with it. So I think we've got some interface issues that need to be solved first, as well as m money issues. <laughs> And when you look at some of the things that have been published for the iPad, for instance, that are, go well beyond just the standard text on a page and have a great de degree of interaction. If you're an author, this, uh, this is a tremendous, another tremendous opportunity. But uh, I think to Brett's point, the publishers, you, you know, I, I think there's a disparity because they think, well, I'm saving here and I'm also going to cut the royalty uh, to the author, that we need, there needs to be a, a, a way to maintain that. The intellectual property is still the value proposition here, and uh, and we have a, a somewhat unbalanced system. I have friends at, at uh, Amazon that will give you chapter and verse on this, so how they're squeezing all all the uh, the pennies out of the process. But there there is, I think, an imbalance here. I don't know whether it'll ever be um, corrected. But when you start, if, if you're an author and you start building these really intricate, involving, engaging uh, environments, hopefully you might be able to say, look, that is a lot more valuable than text. 
I deserve more. And I think there might be uh, some differences between uh, textbooks and primary sources, too, in terms of the dynamics of how that works. I know one of the things that we're spending a lot of time on is looking at not replicating textbooks, but taking uh, readers, course books, uh, and getting those materials uh, available online. And that's a very different dynamic than, than the whole textbook market uh, dynamic. For those of you that didn't have an opportunity to ask your question, our panelists will be uh, here for a little while after our time concludes tonight. I would encourage you to come up to them and ask your question. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for being here tonight. <laughs>